Let's see, this. Let's see if I can make this go. But we want to welcome you here this evening, and uh, thank you for this time together. Did I go the right way? I think I went the wrong way. Oh, there we go. All right, let me highlight a few of the announcements that are coming up. So fall is almost upon us. If you have not already registered your children, or if you know some folks who need to register their children, time is coming. You can do that online at our website at www.tricitybaptist.org. And uh, as well as you can do that here, uh, but that helps us to know how many children we're looking for. Also, if you're uh, desirous to volunteer, I can't speak for Pastor Brian. I doubt it's too late. We love to have as many volunteers as we can. There's a training session here this Wednesday evening uh, for, in room 109 for those who are volunteering for WANA. Otherwise, do take note, uh, we do not have other activities going on. I think the teens are meeting with the Stedmans away, and then we have some organizational things going that evening. And uh, take note of that, but for our general time of a prayer service, we're not having this Wednesday night. Also beginning on uh, September the 1st is our Music Academy and Petite Music. Now, we've got a couple of keyboarding, piano sessions that are being offered this year. And this is a, a tremendous opportunity to introduce our younger children uh, to various aspects of music. In a few minutes, uh, Prudence Truman is going to be bringing the special. We are blessed uh, every week as we look at our choir, as we look at our orchestra, as we have a number of these specials on an evening service like tonight. And it's our teens and it's our youth. It's those who have been exposed to music and coming up and, and providing that next generation of music. So we want to introduce them early. There's petite music for the youngest ones. There's a strings class, a couple piano classes. Please touch base with Katie Richards if you uh, have specific questions about that. Otherwise, you can go online and register directly from our homepage at the website. We do have a church workday scheduled. Uh, we'll get more information to you, Lord willing, by next Sunday, but we are planning a day uh, throughout where folks can come and assist us with trying to knock out a real cleaning of the church. We certainly didn't have opportunity for a spring cleaning, so we'll have a late summer cleaning prior to our 40th anniversary, and we want to welcome you with us that evening. Labor Day trail ride and picnic at the Sins Cabin. Always an adventure for those who are able to go. And so if you have, uh, there's some great trails. I have an opportunity to ride on those trails. I have not crashed on one yet. So that's been fortunate for me <laughs> as I'm not the most skilled rider. Uh, but I do enjoy it and the camaraderie and the fellowship. There is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby if you're interested in and just kind of helps give a heads up. That be, the trail ride begins at nine and then at 12.30 there is a picnic. Bring your own uh, items for the picnic itself, but stay and enjoy fellowship and a time of games and other activities with the Sins. Uh, so put that on your schedule for Labor Day weekend. Uh, 40th anniversary, we're very excited about this Sunday that's coming. We're working really hard to put all the plans in place. And it is just going to be a full morning uh, of looking back at what the Lord has done over the many years of this ministry here, how he's blessed. And uh, we're going to have a time of fellowship and dinner on the grounds. And then we're going to end the day with looking ahead. So, Because as long as the Lord tarries, we want to look ahead. We want to be faithful and wise uh, stewards in how we utilize our time and our resources here at Tri-City Baptist Church to share the gospel. Part of that is our debt retirement. So pray with us that we'll be able to uh, end this debt, this mortgage debt. Um, maybe we can have a symbolic mortgage, mortgage burning. I don't know if we'll try to do that. Probably fire codes wouldn't allow that in here anyway. Uh, but we certainly would love to retire that debt as we look forward and begin planning ahead what the Lord would have us to do and utilize those resources in other areas of ministry. Okay, um, I am going to open us in prayer here 
And uh, just before I do, right before the service, uh, Kathy Mahan shared with me that their son, Clint, who just recently moved to Jefferson City, Missouri, uh, fell this morning and fractured a hip and is looking at surgery tomorrow morning. Now, I share that with you as that's just one of the types of piece of information that we get regularly. I would encourage you uh, to take a look at the Wednesday bulletin. We mail it out every Wednesday. For those of you that are here, pick one up. If you desire a hard copy, we always have extras in the office for the week. And uh, pick that up. It is a, um, a large list of needs and opportunities to pray for folks. And I just encourage you to join us in a season of prayer. So let's go to the Lord now as we open this service tonight. Father, we thank you for the music that we've been able to enjoy. What a blessing it is to calm our hearts and turn our hearts to you and to begin to focus on you, turn out the things of the world and focus on things, those beautiful things above. And we can worship you in our song we worship you in our prayer. We give praise and honor and exalt you in all things. And Father, as we prepare our hearts, we're reminded of those who are in need around us, and we lift up those needs and help us to be faithful prayer warriors. And we want to always give thanks and praise and have gratitude for the many blessings that you bestow upon us and the many opportunities that you offer us to serve you. And we thank you especially for the body of Christ locally here, that as we join together, we know that our hearts will be knit together and you'll join with us and meet with us. And so we ask that you'll just bless this service tonight. We thank you for your word. Thank you for pastor's diligent study and the opportunity to have some questions answered and the book of Leviticus as we continue the Route 66 series. I bless our hearts. And Father, may we yield and humble ourselves before you this night. Use every element of this service for your glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen.
Thank you so much, Prudence. That was found at 239, if you want to flip through and read the words. I like the last part of the last verse. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. On Christ I stand. Thank you so much. That's challenging to play unaccompanied like that. Really beautiful in its simplicity. Wonderful job, Prudence. Well, let's stand together and sing another of these oldies but goodies that I've been resurfacing on Sunday nights. How Can I Fear? Number 165. When shadows fall and the night covers all, there are things that my eyes cannot see. I'll never the Savior is near, my Lord abides with me. How can I fear? Jesus is near. He ever watches over me. Worries all cease. He gives me Thank you, Brother Colin, and good evening. Good to have you with us. Como uh, esta usted? My friends, good to have you here as well. Some folks visiting us, uh, participated in the Hispanic Church. Great to have you out tonight. Uh, Buenos noches. We are looking at the 66 books of the Bible. We're calling it Route 66 or Route 66 for some of you. How you'd like to pronounce that R-O-U-T-E word. So a couple of weeks ago, we uh, did a book study on the book of Leviticus, all 27 chapters, kind of a big overview. And then we've asked for you to give questions on that book. And so I had many, many actually this time, maybe 20 or so questions. We'll try to get through them as, as efficiently as possible. Uh, but they're great questions. And um, hopefully you'll continue to apply that diligence to the book of Numbers and the book of Deuteronomy uh, as they come out in just a couple weeks. Next Sunday night, I've asked Brian Malik to give a message on uh, critical race theory in the Bible. It's a very hot topic, and I think it would be helpful to have a, a biblical perspective of what, what that's all about or what, it, what, what the concern should be for Christians. So we look forward to that study. Okay, if you have your Bibles, I'm not even sure where to begin. We can say chapter 10, maybe. Um, but let's just start with chapter one. We'll just start right in the beginning and walk through these questions. I put them in a chronological or a chapter order. 
as I uh, put them all, put it all together. So uh, let me read the questions that you gave to me, and I'll try to answer them from the book of Leviticus. So uh, the first question, kind of a, a generic, broad question, do you think Leviticus helps support what Catholics believe? Uh, for, the, for example, having to go to the priest instead of going to God, straight to God. Do you think that this book could be used to justify their, their priestly system? Well, certainly it could. I mean, they, they take advantage of anything that relates to a priest. Um, the, the Roman Catholic system is, is a sacerdotal system. It's a priestly system. Uh, it, all, it's all rely, it all relies on the priest from your birth to your death. And so anything that references a priest, they're going to take that and run with it. Now, if you go you know, in, into the context of the priests and the instructions for them in the book of Leviticus, uh, you're not going to come out with Catholic theology by any stretch, uh, but they could take advantage of it. The, uh, the high priest, as you study the Old Testament, uh, his office pictures Christ's office as high priest. So when Christ is born, lives, he functions as a prophet, priest, and king. And so really when he surfaces in his earthly role, uh, he really uh, takes the place of the Old Testament priest. He sets that office aside, and he is the fulfillment of what in many ways that office uh, was typical of. So the high priest was a type. Christ is the antitype of the fulfillment of it. So once Christ is here, we don't need any Old Testament high priests anymore. We have Christ and him alone. Um, with the New Testament era that we are participating in, we're no longer under law. And the law really needed a priest to do their thing with the animal sacrifices and all the other ceremonies. So once that law was fulfilled by Christ, by his act of obedience, and then um, his death and resurrection, again, all this Old Testament law stuff is set aside. And that would include the dietary laws, the laws pertaining to the Jewish calendar, and so much of the, 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 the animal sacrifice systems all set aside. So um, to answer that question partially. Another point, a big difference between a Catholic priest and an Old Testament priest, um, the, the Old Testament priests, if they were faithful to God, they realized they were fallen creatures, they were sinners, just like the people they were serving. In fact, in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 11, the high priest, the highest in rank, you know, the high priest, uh, he would offer sacrifices for his own sins. He would acknowledge before God he was a sinner. He needed forgiveness. He needed cleansing just like anyone else. And so uh, they did not elevate themselves in a righteous sake over regular people because they recognized they were sinners just like the rest of the people. Uh, that would be a little different view than we would see in the Catholic system. So hopefully that would maybe give some thoughts to that question and then the answer. Uh, another question, um, were the ceremonies that the Jews, that they were practicing, uh, were they new to them, or was it some re-education? Were they being heavily influenced by the Babylonian religion, especially uh, being later captured? So that's a good, a good question. Uh, Babel has always had an influence on man from the very beginning. Uh, that Nimrod kingdom, that's a rich theme. But when it comes to Babylonian influence, that's going to take place uh, from 605 to whatever time period, the next 70 years or so. Uh, the Jews would be taken into captivity through three phases in the 600s through the 500s, and then they were out with the Babylonians and influenced by them. Uh, so around 586 when the temple fell and then the captivity that did follow uh, is really what we would call an anachronism. So the question you're asking, we're asked that, is uh, the Babylonian influence took place many, you know, 900 years after Moses wrote Leviticus. So Leviticus is written 1446 BC, the fall of the temple 587, 586 BC. So um, there's some timing issues with that question. Um, a question was brought up, and some of these are similar that I, I received. In chapter 1, verse 3, it, it says, if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation uh, before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering and it should be accepted for him to make atonement for him and so on. So the question was asked, referencing that text and a number of others, what is the difference between the word offering and sacrifice? Is there a difference between in our, in our English Bibles here, uh, a difference between these words? 
And then uh, the person was, did a pretty good study on peace offerings and kind of gave some references to Leviticus in the peace offerings. So to answer these, these word definitions, you always want to go to good resources that um, le lexicons that give you very uh, good definitions. You, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica and, and whatever Wikipedia can help you. But when you're doing theology, you want better resources than that. So some of the, the better resources out there is Logos. is a tremendous, powerful program. Logos, you can get that on your computer. It depends which installment you want. It can only, it's only 400 or 800 or 2,000 or 4,000 or $8,000. You kind of, you just order what you want, right? Uh, and that has some very powerful word tools, but maybe that's a little overpriced. Bible Works is another computer program, a little cheaper. If you want to go old fashioned and just go to a really good hardcover lexicon, the very best Old Testament Hebrew lexicon is what is called the Brown Driver Briggs Lexicon. And it's currently on sale as a hardcover by CBD, which is Christian Book Distributors for $19.95. You can buy it tonight. Usually it's $40. If you have a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, you can look at these words and answer the, some of these questions that were brought up. So is there a difference between the word offering and sacrifice? Yes, there is some differences. Um, every single word you have to look up in the lexicon because you're going to see the word offering uh, in our English Bible numerous times, but behind that word offering is a number of Hebrew words, and each one has a little bit different uh, slice of meaning. So here, verse 3, the word offering is the Hebrew word karbon, which means an offering, just a gift. It's a generic word, very broad. It could be a, a gift as a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, an animal sacrifice. It could be a gift of, of crops, grain. It could be money as a gift. It's a very broad word. So karbon. The word burnt sacrifice here in verse 3, uh, and this is often the case with these words, especially when, it, when you deal with the word offering or sacrifice. In our English Bibles, we have two words, burnt sacrifice. In the Hebrew Old Testament, it's only one word, only one word, ola. Ola, and it means literally burnt sacrifice. So some of these questions about word meanings, if you have a good lexicon, uh, the Hebrew is really, really specific with these type of offerings. So burnt sacrifice, ola, one Hebrew word. It is an offering, but it's more specific. It's dealing with an animal sacrifice that is put to death and completely consumed on the altar. Uh, chapter seven, verse 10, you're gonna see the word meat offering. Somewhat misleading in our King James meat offering. Again, two English words, meat offering. In the Hebrew, it's minha, and it literally is grain offering, grain offering, grain offering. And that, that's a very precise uh, translation, grain offering. In chapter 7, verse 11, you see again the word peace offerings. When you see the two English words, peace offerings, it's reflecting one Hebrew word, <laughs> shelamim, shelamim. That's the word, Hebrew word for peace offering. Chapter 7, verse 29, uh, you have another word here, the offer, he offereth the sacrifice, the sacrifice, it's another Hebrew word, seba, and this is a word which means communal sacrifice, where you share the, share the sacrifice on the altar, you enjoy a meal together. So the best thing I can say on these words, is there a difference between this word and that word, get a good lexicon, look them up, and it'll really give you um, greater clarity and precision in your understanding of the word. Okay, let's turn to chapter 10. This is a great question. I've referenced it a little bit, but let's go into a little more detail tonight. Uh, the question of strange fire, strange fire. So chapter 10 and verse 2, the question was, what was the strange fire offered by these two men, Nadab and Abihu? What, what, what is the strange fire? What was so strange about it? What, what was the problem with it? So let's read in chapter 10 of Leviticus. Uh, verse 1, verse 2, and Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So this is really tragic. You know, the tabernacle's just been built. <laughs> Things are set up. The priests are put in place to serve. They're ready to get going to worship the Lord. And all of a sudden you have this, this tragedy where two of the high priests, four sons are killed. Just boom, just like that, just like that. So whatever the strange fire is, we, we know it's something that God did not command. 
So they're doing something unauthorized. Uh, this is religion gone free enterprise. They're doing something outside of the box, something that wasn't uh, permitted by the Lord. And the consequence was obviously quite severe. So let's, let's talk about this a little bit. So with the tabernacle, I should have a picture here, but the tabernacle, out in the outer courtyard, you have the bronze altar. And that altar, you know, big square grill, you put your stakes on it, you would put the animals on that grill. And depending on what type of offering they were, certain things would be done on the grill. If it's a burnt offering, it's just all is consumed. If it's a peace offering, certain parts of the meat are going to go in certain directions to certain people, uh, including you, the worshiper. And so each sacrifice is, you know, is the, the sacrifice is done in the burnt offering. Now, when God set up this Old Testament system of worship, the, the initial fire, the igniting point, because now the thing's all set up, but there's no fire. God sends fire from heaven to the bronze altar and boom, lights it. So God takes the initiative. It was divine. It was miraculous. Got their attention real quick that this, this was God's initiative. This is God's work. It's his way. And uh, he's a consuming fire. He's one you fear and reverence. So, so that altar was started by God. Now you have coals. And this thing's just 24-7. <laughs> you, 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 you got, you're, it's always hot. It's always cooking. Okay, so your grill is, you don't have to turn it on and off. It's on. <laughs> And what you would do as a priest, you would have your censer, these golden censers, and you would take the uh, coals from the bronze altar. And you'd, you'd put them in your censer and you'd walk in to the building, into the, into the building, which has two components, two parts, the holy place, and then the cubicle area known as the Holy of Holies. And in the holy place, to the right, you have the table of showbread, to the left, you have the lampstand with the, with the lights. And right before the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies is a golden incense altar. So bronze outside, gold inside. And so the priest was to take the coals from the bronze and put them on that altar. And then you have, you have coals. It's, it's hot. You don't need to relight it. It's going. Just sustain it. And so God wanted to draw on a connection between sac the altar of sacrifice and the altar of incense, which represented prayer. So there's a connection between our prayer life and the sacrifice of Christ. We can't have access to God except it is through Christ's sacrifice. He is our high priest. He has made the way, and we can go to God directly in prayer based on what he did for us through the cross. He invites us to come boldly to his throne. So a very, very, very powerful connection between the two altars. And then what the priests would do, they had um, an incense formula where they would make these, bring these things together in a certain <laughs> uh, recipe, and they would take that, they, they would take the incense in, and they would cast the incense on that golden altar with the coals. And as soon as the incense hit the coals, woof, a, a cloud would be formed, and it almost was another barrier between you and in the unique presence of God in the Holy of Holies. It almost created like a, you know, a cloud, and it did. But now, all of a sudden, inside the holy place, you have the incense hitting those coals, and whoo, boy, the smell of that just, mmm, 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 just beautiful. So you're smelling steaks outside, right? And now incense inside. So your senses are definitely, you know, tripped. on When you go there, you smell. Now, I don't smell. I don't smell anything yet. I had covid 100 and whatever, 37 days ago, I still can't smell a thing, okay? I would love to smell incense. I'd love to smell a good steak. I'd like to taste a good steak. Everything tastes like rubber still to me. But when you went into that tabernacle, wow, it just, it just popped. You would smell. So that was the way it was supposed to be done. So these two priest sons, these two PKs, they did something that God did not command them to do. So here are the suggestions. It doesn't tell us, so we're guessing. We're reading between the lines and trying to come out with the best. Probably the, the best approach or thought is that the strange fire is that these guys saw the flame of God come down. That was, that was pretty exciting. And they heard that God's unique presence is in the Holy of Holies. I think there's a lot of curiosity 
and they are privileged kids. Aaron, their daddy, is the high priest. Wow, he's authorized. Actually, Aaron can go into that Holy of Holies once a year on, on Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. So likely, these, these kids, these men, got coals out of a fire that had no relationship to the bronze altar. Maybe a fire outside of the little tabernacle tent, that seven and a half foot wall outside a fire. Perhaps they took the coals and brought the incense in and uh, they went into the, into, into the holy place and made this offering with strange fire, unauthorized fire. Unauthorized that there wasn't any connection to the bronze altar. No connection between sacrifice and intercession and prayer. One suggestion, it's, it's very possible that's exactly what happened. So uh, strange fire, and we could say it might mean an unauthorized source of either the coals or the incense itself is a suggestion to an unauthorized source. Or perhaps it was strange because it was authored, uh, offered at the wrong time. Probably not, but these are suggestions you'll read out there. Every morning, the priest was to bring in 50 shekels worth of incense. Every morning, the high, uh, a priest would come in and offer incense on that altar, the golden altar. On Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, it was the high priest who did it. But during the, during the year, by lot, it, was, it would fall upon certain priests, certain days to go in and do that. We see that in the New Testament in Luke with a particular man going in. It was his once-in-a-lifetime chance to do it. And wow, did he get a revelation in there, okay? So uh, John the Baptist. Okay, so what we've got here is a priest doing it in the morning and in the evening, every single day, incense placed on the altar. Did they go at another time during the day? Unauthorized time? Probably not. Was it strange because they went in and they went behind the veil or peeked behind the veil into the Holy of Holies? So some unauthorized access. They were forbidden to go into the Holy of Holies. Did, their, did the curiosity kill the priest kids? Okay. And wouldn't you want to look behind it? And, and this goes way beyond the Wizard of Oz. Don't look at the man behind the veil. Don't look at the man behind the veil. You know, No, this God's unique presence is, is there in the Holy of Holies. And do they want to just kind of get a little peek? Did they go in? Because we know that God judges them from the Holy of Holies. The, the fire of God comes from that source, from that location. Is that it, unauthorized access? Again, speculation. Were they the wrong people to offer incense, unauthorized people? Well, they're, they're priests, high priest sons, but it's really a role of their dad. So maybe that was part of the problem. In chapter 10, verse 9, if you read there, this is really strange that this little verse is interjected in this discourse. Do not drink wine or strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. <laughs> well, they had died. They were the priest's sons. Were they drunk? And were they offering strange fire? Were they, was, were they kind of cavalier about this whole thing? disrespectful probably part of it were they drunk i don't know but some have suggested the, the connection why is this here it's really a strange location unless there's a correlation so maybe that factored into it so those are some of the suggestions whatever it was it was something that was prohibited not directed by god they did wrong they created it they did not fear god and his word and they paid they paid dearly they paid dearly with god judging them now in the same context look at verses 19 and 20 on that same day, the next question is, what does 10, 19, and 20 mean? Why was Moses angry with Aaron? What does Aaron's response mean? Why did it appease or content Moses? So let's just read the two verses. And Aaron said unto Moses, Behold this day have they offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord, and such things have befallen me. And if I had eaten the sin offering today, should it have been accepted in the sight of the Lord? And when Moses heard that, he was content. So uh, let me just explain what's happening here. So uh, two of his four sons, Nadab and Abihu, are put to de death because of spiritual malpractice. They messed up. Something procedural, something wrong. They're judged. So now on that day, there are still two living sons, Eleazar and Ithamar. So they're alive. They're going to have to keep working. The work continues. They just lost their brothers. Uh, very sobering experience. And so they needed to pull it together, they needed to cowboy up and do the right thing as priests. 
Well, there was certain offerings that were prescribed by God to take place. One was a sin offering, and part of the sin offering was to be held back for the priests for them to eat. And so what happened on this day, there's burnt offerings, whoop, up, up in smoke, no one eats. Sin offering, part of the meat comes back for the priests, kind of part of their payment for their services and for their enjoyment and pleasure and sustenance. So what happened on this day, burnt offering on the altar outside, up in smoke, just like it should be. Sin offering, it's out there. How do you like your steak? Do you like it rare, medium, uh, extra well done or whatever? They just let the thing ride on the altar and burn it to a crisp. And, and Aaron doesn't eat any of the meat. He should have. It was allocated for him. So he, he just doesn't, doesn't follow the procedure. And Moses is ticked off. Moses is saying, look, we just lost two priest sons because they offered strange fire. They had a procedural problem. And now you're not following procedures? Are you kidding? You didn't learn from what happened earlier today? Aaron, wake up. <laughs> yes, you lost your boys, but come on. You, you, got, you, you can't change the plans. You, you can't get a new rule book. This is the rules. You got to eat this, eat the meat. And so Moses is angry and, and he, he addresses Aaron and Aaron basically says, are you kidding, Moses? <laughs> Give me a break, dude, is what he says in the Hebrew, okay? Give me a break. I just lost two of my boys. And quite frankly, read between the lines, I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry. Uh, and I'm just, I don't even want to be here. I'm going through the motions. I just lost my boys. I'm hurting. Could you show a little grace <laughs> with my loss? I'm not going to change the procedures. I'm not trying to rebel against God. I'm just having a really bad day. And when Moses really heard the heart of Aaron, he says, okay, I get it. I get it. And that contented him. It pleased him. He understood. Okay, you're right. You're right. So that's what's happening there. And there's a really neat, neat truth. Uh, there's a principle for us. God is very sympathetic to human sorrow and loss. Because two boys, they messed up procedurally. They're struck dead. You would think, okay, if he took those two guys out, why doesn't he take Eleazar and Ithamar out? They didn't follow procedures with daddy either. It's a whole different attitude. One was a disrespectful cavalier attitude. These people here were, were just suffering the loss. And they're not thinking well. They're not performing well. And there was a little bit of grace. You, you'll see at times when we have funerals here, we are very sympathetic to the family who loses a loved one. We're a little more gracious, a little more forbearing in things we might permit. Uh, I'm not a real big fan of Elvis, okay? Just quite frankly, okay? So if we have a funeral and, and, and Bubba who just, lo who just died and, 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 the, and his wife says, Bubba loves Elvis, could Elvis sing in the service Amazing Grace, Okay. I'm going to say, you know what, probably Colin and I wouldn't choose Elvis to sing Amazing Grace in the morning service. We just probably wouldn't have Elvis sing. But this is your loss, and he loved Elvis. So, oh, brother, okay, we're, we'll be sympathetic. We're going to have Elvis sing Amazing Grace, okay? Is that okay? Maybe not my preference. Probably not our standard to have Elvis sing. But, but Bubba has just died, and the wife really, this is his favorite song by Elvis so you know what happens? They say, you know what, I can live with that. Can you live with that? Can you live with that? Well, some people can't. And some people can. So we're a little more gracious when people lose loved ones. Okay? And uh, my, my dad and my stepmom loved Elvis. They were at his last concert. Okay? So there's a lot of people who love Elvis. He had a beautiful voice. And uh, I hope he knew the Lord. Okay. So what we have here is uh, some really neat teachings from the scriptures. Okay. Let's go to another one. Chapter 13 is the leprosy chapter. So the question is, how could leprosy cause infection in people's clothes and in the walls of their houses? Could leprosy be the same as mold or you know, uh, items like that? Is this a translation issue of lep the word leprosy? And yes, yes, this is a translation issue. This is the lexicon. You need to dig in a little bit more. Uh, the Hebrew lexicon, once again, the, 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 Hebrew, the English word leprosy that you read about, uh, literally could be translated skin disease of any type of skin disease. In fact, uh, chapter 13 describes 21 different skin diseases all under the, un, under the umbrella word leprosy, skin diseases. The word leprosy can also mean 
uh, Hansen's disease, leprosy as we know it. So the context is going to determine, is it Hansen's disease, which in the ancient world was incurable by natural means, or is it another skin disease? And there was a process in which you tested skin diseases to see if it was contagious. There was a treatment plan for some of them, and there was a ceremonial plan to get you to re-enter into the fellowship uh, of the Jewish family. In chapter 13, verse 47, the word leprosy there, is, it's described in garments and in clothes. What's going on there? Can leprosy, you know, get into all that? Well, again, this word is really broad. It's used there and would cover things like molds, mildews, and fungus. You know, we looked at a house with our son, John and Stephanie. Beautiful house was next to a stream. But as we went into the basement, it was all black mold. Uh, they looked at another house and uh, all the gray water went under the house. This is South Carolina living. I mean, they, they did not have a pipe. So when you did your dishes, it just went under the house. They had beautiful property and they probably had a still up on the hill. I mean, you can just imagine a still up on the hill. <laughs> and we said, John, this is a great house, but all that sitting water under your house in South Carolina, this is going to be a cockroach condominium. You've probably got every snake in the world underneath there, and you have molds. You don't want this house. You don't want this house, okay? So that chapter does describe the word is used to cover molds, mildews, different fungus that could be dangerous to your health. Leviticus 14.2, the question was, in Scripture, is it found that a leper was cured by any natural processes? So if you're thinking of Hansen's disease, no. Of the 21 lepers that were healed in the Bible, all 21 were supernaturally healed. Other skin diseases were healed through natural processes in some cases. Um, I have a skin disease. Okay, so I've, I have shingles. Shingles is an immune problem, a deficiency in your immune system. So if you've had chicken pox, th that virus is in your, in your spinal column. It's there. And your immune system is suppressing the shingles. But if your immune system gets compromised or weakened, all of a sudden you get shingles. And th th this isn't the shingles on top of a house. <laughs> this is the belt around your upper torso from the middle of, the, of, your, of your sternum area around to your back. And if you get a really good case, it oozes. And it, it is miserable. It is miserable. And so I get shingles under my eyelids, on my eyelids. And it hurts. <laughs> It hurts, but it can be helped if you work on your immune system. So I talked to one of my doctor friends, actually at the, at the uh, whatever you call the guy. I said, what is it? The priest, thank you, the pharmacist. <laughs> and he said, you know, you have an immune problem. I get it, I get it. I have an immune problem. I've been weakened. I know I'm, I'm, I'm wimpy. He said, you need to rebuild your immune system. Here's some things, natural things you can take to help your immune system. Um, zinc, for instance, he said, you need more zinc, probably. Vitamin C. So I amped up the vitamin C. I'm not recommending any of this for you. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> but I did follow his advice and got zinc going and some other vitamins. And within 30 days, I've not had any of that, that skin disease or rash under my eyelids. It just burned and was really miserable, miserable. So there are skin diseases that can be healed from whatever natural means that God prescribed but when it came to leprosy, as you would think of a leper, no one was healed except by God himself. Hey, chapter 16, verse 7, why two goats? This is the Day of Atonement. Two goats were used in the ceremony. And we have two objects. There's two messages, two lessons, two stories, two illustrations, two aspects. So the two goats, the one goat was the scapegoat, which was removed from the land and taken to the wilderness, just out of sight. That scapegoat, the living goat, pictures God taking sin away. Expiation, ex out of, taking it out, removing it. So the one living goat pictured Christ's future work of expiation, where he removes our sin as far as from east as from west. The goat which died and its blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, that death of the goat pictured propitiation where we have violated the word of God and God, we have, to, we have a wrathful God who hates sin. And that death of the goat is it foreshadowed Christ's death 
satisfies the wrath of a holy God. So propitiate means to satisfy wrath. And so Christ is pictured in the goat that lived, picturing his expiation, his work of expiation and removal of sin. The goat that died pictures his work of propitiation, the appeasement of God's wrath toward us because of our sin. Leviticus 16, another question related to this, this day. We know one purpose for the Day of Atonement is that it foreshadows Christ's future crucifixion and redemption for mankind. What exactly did this atonement covering a sin accomplish for the Old Testament Jews? And um, the word at, uh, atonement means at one meant. So it's dealing with reconciliation that is seen by the covering of sin, but it make, as the result of that covering, it results in being at one meant with God. And so as with all of the Old Testament sacrifices, none of them were efficacious. That's a fancy word. None of them were efficacious. And the word efficacious means effective. So not one animal sacrifice was effective to remove your sin, to atone for your sin, to cleanse you from your sin. Not one of them. But as you looked at those sacrifices and you obeyed God, and you understood that these, these were symbolic that they pointed to the future Lamb of God whose blood sacrifice is efficacious. And so faith looking forward to the cross would be what saved people in the Old Testament and was what made that, made that sins washed away. The efficaciousness was their faith in the coming Messiah who was going to die for them. So just keep, keep it straight, whether you're in the millennium, which we'll cover in a couple weeks in the morning, whether you have sacrifices in the millennium, none of them are efficacious. They're memorial sacrifices. Old Testament, they're all foreshadowing the work of the cross. So just keep that straight. Uh, I know today there is no day of atonement. They, don't, they can't sacrifice animals right now. They don't have a temple. So they've had to improvise and tweak their, their holy days, and they're all less than satisfactory the way they do it. Okay, chapters 10 and 24 you have a list of particular offenses that leads to the death penalty. And so the question, good question, this, should this, the death penalty, be put into practice for those specific offenses against God by nations today, like the Christian Reconstructionists say? What about the eye for eye and tooth for tooth? How does that fit with the New Testament saying to love your enemies and to do good to those who abuse you? So really, there's a couple questions here. So let's take the first one. There were particular sins, if they were committed under the Jewish law, Mosaic law, under God's theocracy, where the consequence was to be the death penalty. And probably rarely did they comply by putting people to death when they sinned in the ways we're going to see listed. But they were supposed to, to fulfill law. So in chapter 20 of Leviticus, let's just turn there for a moment, Leviticus 20, you have a particular sin. And um, pretty nasty sin. And Moses spake unto the Mos uh, Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. So uh, Molech, is, Molech is, a, is a horrible idol. Uh, he is... Uh, has the head of an ox and the body of a man, made of, typically made of bronze with a hollow interior. So the worship of Molech, you would have a fire inside of the image. So here you have the head of an ox, grotesque body of a man, and you would have the arms of Molech usually out in front, bronze. And they would crank up the fire inside of the image. And if you were to worship Molech, you would bring your children, your little baby, your little boy, your little girl, and you would come in your act of worship, you would put the child in the arms of the image and sacrifice that child in the arms of Molech. So the worship of Molech in, involved child sacrifice. And I'll tell you what, when you, when you read about Solomon, Solomon was complicit with Molech worship for a period. That's really gross, okay? Death penalty, death penalty. So uh, involved in Molech worship, death penalty. You have in verses 9 through 21, anything immoral, adultery, incest, bestiality, all these grotesque perversions, death penalty, absolute death penalty. 
chapter 20, verse 27, if you're complicit with, with d d d demonic activity, <laughs> such as a wizard, what's a wizard? A wizard is the opposite of a witch. It's, a, it's the man wizard, witch. Uh, you, they were to be stoned, verse 27. So if you're playing with witchcraft, occult, they were to stone them under Mosaic law. So in, in church history, you have in, in New England, for instance, the witch trials. Maybe someone had a birthmark. And you thought it was demonic, and there were people put to death because they thought they were witches. And um, they thought they were obeying God in Leviticus chapter 20 here and uh, verse 27. So is that a proper application? I think that's the question. Should we as Christians put to death people who cross over these different lines? Uh, the guy who's collecting wood on the Sabbath was stoned. So uh, today, if you did any work that was not a work of mercy and necessity, should we stone you tonight? Should we have the deacons come forward? Um, did anyone mow their yard today? I'm just curious. Did anyone mow their yards? Be honest. Be honest. Did anyone mow their yard today? You, Carol, you did, and you're a deacon's wife. Can mow the yard. You, are, you've got to be kidding. Are you serious? When I was growing up, you would never, never hear a mower on Sunday. Never. Ken Crane. <laughs> you heathen. All right, so what we're going to do tonight after this service, we're going to have a stoning of Ken Crane because <laughs> he's violated the law of the Sabbath, okay? Do we do that? No, of course not. I speak as an idiot. Okay, I speak as a fool, right? So what we have here is yes, there were certain mosaic laws that were to be complied to with the death penalty. Are we under such obligation? No, we are not under an obligation. There is one particular sin that is highlighted that is given to us pre-law. So in Genesis chapter 9, before mosaic law, there is a statement that is given by Moses in the writing of Genesis that if you murdered someone, you killed someone, the just consequence is for you to be put to death. That's before Mosaic law. So what's being set up and established there, there is a place for capital punishment. And each government has the authority, they have been given the sword to use for issues within and without. And so there is a place for, for capital punishment for, for, for murder. What would that do if, if those who were convicted of, let's say, first degree murder were put to death, executed? You think that would be a little bit of a deterrent in Chicago? Maybe, you think? Of course it is, of course it is. So uh, there is a place for the death penalty, but we're not gonna go to the point of taking all of Mosaic law and under Jewish law and transfer that over to Christian responsibility. That's a disaster. This is where John Calvin got in trouble. He's in Geneva. There's a guy that comes into town and he's a wolf, he's a wolf. He denies the Trinity, he denies the Trinity. So what's John Calvin say? He says, you are blaspheming God. And in the Old Testament Mosaic law, blasphemers were to be stoned. Blasphemers were to be stoned. John, chapter Leviticus 24, 10 for 16. And so John Calvin, in good conscience, takes out Servanarola, whatever his name was, Servetus, whatever his name was. He takes him out, kills him, thinking he's doing God a favor, doing the right thing. Where did he get that application? Right here. So this is a pertinent question. It was, it's totally wrong. Totally wrong. But that in his context, he thought he needed to do that to please God, that, that application of Scripture, bad hermeneutics, okay? All right, when it comes to loving your enemies, do not get caught in the trap that this is only a New Testament teaching. To love your enemies is something Jesus thought of and gave to us. <laughs> no, when he talks about the law and loving your enemies, it was the people who perverted the Old Testament in so many applications, and one of their twisted thoughts was you were to hate your enemy. You were never to hate your enemy. You are never to hate your enemy. Um, Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 29, it tells us to love your enemy, and he tells you three ways to show that love, by blessing them who curse you, for praying for those who despise you, and, and doing good in them who hate you. So we are, we're to love our enemy. But in the Old Testament, over and over and over, you have illustrations of God's love being taught to his people to love the enemies. We're to love the foreigner, whatever, whatever. Proverbs 25, 21, if you have an enemy, if he's hungry, feed him. If you have an enemy, he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Exodus 23, 4, and 5, summarizing. 
If you find your enemy's lost ox or donkey, you return it to your enemy. If the ox is stuck in the ditch and he can't get it out, you help him get it out. You love your, you love your enemy. Great opportunities to show the grace of God. You don't rejoice when your enemy falls. Elijah counsels the, the Syrian POWs. He, he shows love to them and mercy to them, tells them what they should do and not to do. Yes, but he was merciful to them. You never so touch the ocean of God's love as when you forgive and love your enemies. Corey Tenboom. The Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also love our enemies, probably because they're generally the same people. <laughs> G.K. Chesterton. Always love your enemy. Always love your enemy. Well, what about certain prayers that are imprecatory prayers? Yeah, I get that. That doesn't mean you hate your enemy. Imprecatory prayers always, if you get this straight, imprecatory prayers were always based on what God had promised to Abraham. Those who bless Abraham will be what? Blessed. Those who curse Abram and his and Israel will be cursed. So an imprecatory prayer was basically saying, God, you said when your enemies blaspheme Israel that you would curse them, and all I'm asking you to do in prayer is to do what you promised to do. That's all I'm asking. I'm asking you to keep your word. You said you would curse those who cursed Israel. I'm just appealing to what you said. That's an imprecatory psalm. But the Bible, cover to cover, you, it's all about loving God and loving your neighbors yourself. Always, 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 always. So just uh, try to keep that straight. All right, the next question. Leviticus 23, the, the chapter on the calendar, the, the holy calendar, seven different feasts. Someone asked, uh, would you just quickly review those? So I'll review them very quickly. So every Jewish holy day feast goes back and looks at something in history and it's commemorating something historical. So the Sabbath is commemorating the seventh day of God's creative week where God ceased from his creative work. He wasn't tired, okay? He ceased from his creative work on the seventh day. So the Sabbath looks back to that rest day. It looks forward to the rest which is in Jesus. You can't save yourself by works. You by faith must trust in his works rest in that and you're saved and then beyond that there's a rest that remains for the people of god it's called eternity so the sabbath looks back to the seventh day of creation and it also looks forward to the rest in christ and the rest for the believer throughout eternity it's beautiful okay so let's talk about the other feasts most of us will see and understand the passover first fruits feast of unleavened bread pentecost and even tabernacles most of us will peg prophetically the, the two that are most challenging is the Day of Trumpets, uh, Feast of Trumpets, and the Fast of Yom Kippur. Let's talk through it. So clearly, Passover, past view is re reflecting, commemorating the deliverance from Israel when God passed over those homes that had the blood. Real simple. Future, Paul says, Jesus is our Passover. All right, done deal. Interpretation's over. Christ fulfills it by dying on the Passover as the Passover lamb himself. First fruits was the feast in the spring. The first Sunday after the Passover, there was to be a wave offering. What's a wave offering? You wave it before the Lord. You take your offering. What's a heave offering? You're exalting it. You're giving elevation to your gift. And so the first feast of first fruits was on the first Sunday after, the, after Passover, and it pictured Christ being the first fruits from the dead. First person to be resurrected from the grave with a glorified body, with a glorified body. He's the first fruits from the dead. So real simple. Passover, his death, first fruits, his resurrection. Now to enjoy the work of Christ, you need to understand the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was a week-long feast, and uh, they were in a hurry to get out of, out of Egypt, so they didn't have time to put yeast in their bread to wait for it to rise, so they had bread without yeast, leaven. So remember that? Go forward. If you're going to enjoy the cross and the resurrection of Christ, you must put out leaven. Leaven pictures sin. You have to confess, repent, forsake sin if you're going to enjoy Christ. Beautiful. Okay. The summer feast Pentecost, two lows representing two entities, two people sets, Jews, Gentiles, becoming one loaf, one body, a new man, a new creation called the church. So Pentecost marks the birth of the church. Very, very powerful. Then you go from the spring to the, the summer, and now we have a gap to the fall. That gap represents the church age. So now we come to the fall feast, and these are the tricky ones. 
And this is where people get really crazy. They hear the word trumpet, Feast of Trumpets, uh, seventh month, October, usually first day of the month. And they say, trumpets, Jesus is coming with the trump of God. It must mean the rapture. That's a disaster hermeneutically. Disaster. Don't even go there. So trumpets are used to gather God's people, but there's got to be a Jewish element to this, and there's also got to be a sequence. So something's going to fulfill this on the first day of the month. Ten days later, there's another feast, technically a fast, Yom Kippur. Something happens event-wise on that day. Ten days later, five days later, tabernacles begin. They all are lumped together, and they're going to be fulfilled prophetically on the first of the month, ten days later, and then five days later. And if you think trumpets is the rapture, what are you going to do with Yom Kippur? What are you going to do with tabernacles? You get a big seven-year gaps. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's terrible. It's inconsistent uh, understanding of what happened in the spring feasts. So trumpets, it has to deal with God gathering his people. So it relates to that just as simply and as broadly as we can interpret safely is to say trumpets are going to be blown on the first day of the seventh month to gather the people, to gather the elect from the four corners, to gather Israel. So there's a gathering. Where's the gathering point? Jerusalem. All right. Day of Atonement. Jews are coming. There's a gathering. I'm going to say that trumpets is at the end of the tribulation. Day of Atonement, the seventh month, tenth day is going to be a day that Israel will acknowledge that Jesus is their Messiah. And they are going to connect the dots that they are the ones who crucified him. And they're going to mourn over their sin. It's going to be a deep time of introspection and repentance. It will take place in Israel, likely on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. So Day of Atonement, Israel's gathered. There's a recognition that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one. They crucified him, and now there's a, a fountain drawn uh, and, and blood flowing from Emmanuel's veins, and that fountain is open to Israel. Does that mean that Jesus comes back on Yom Kippur? doesn't require that. doesn't require that at all. In fact, you, as soon as you start guessing when the rapture, the day, month, year, and you start guessing the revelation at the end of the seven years, you're going to get in trouble every single time. And anyone who thinks they've pinned it down, no man knows it. Just keep it real simple. No man knows the day or the hour. Just keep it simple. But there will be an acknowledgement of Messiah. Now, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 12, you can start playing with some numbers if you like the numbers. In that prophecy, in that chapter, it starts off with two resurrections, the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. And just looking at it, you could say, well, that looks like it's going to all happen at once. No, not necessarily. I think there's a thousand years between the resurrection of Israel, of the Old Testament saints, and the resurrection of the unjust before the white throne at the end of the millennium. Well, what you do have in that, in chapter 12, verse 12, there's some numbers that are played, and I think you need to wrestle with it. So we know from Daniel's prediction that 1260 days into the tribulation, the abomination of desolation will occur, will appear. And that's the Antichrist claiming to be Messiah God in the temple that's built in Jerusalem. So 1260 days, three and a half years, 42 months, however you want to parse it out. In the midpoint of the tribulation, now we have a man, the Antichrist. From that point, Daniel says for 1290 days, that's three and a half years plus 30 days, Antichrist will cause the sacrificial system that was being operating, it was operational in tribulation, the first part will cause it to cease. And then Daniel says something very impressive. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. So Antichrist mid-tribulation, go three and a half years and go 30 more days, and that's a bad, bad scenario. And then something happens to Antichrist. And then at that point, at 1290 to 1335, there's 45 days. And Daniel says, blessed is that person who endures and who waits until the 1335th day. So something really big is going to happen between those 45 years 
that brings us to this really high watermark of blessed is that person who makes it to this point. So what happens? What happens? Let's talk about it. There's one more feast, tabernacles. John chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. The Greek word is tabernacled. So in his humanity, Christ tabernacled. He was with us. So the Feast of Tabernacles was a look back to see God with his people for 40 years with his people in unique ways, providing. So that's the historic mem memorial. Prophetically, it speaks of where Jesus Christ will be on the earth tabernacling with his people. And it's not a one-day event feast. It's a week plus one. So it's picturing a time period. And that time period is the millennium. And there's an eighth day to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a Sabbath. At the end of the millennium, there's a Sabbath remaining for the people of God. So that little dinky Sabbath on the end of the feast represents the eternal age. Now, someone asked a question about the, the, the day of Jubilee, the year of Jubilee. In chapter 25, verse 9, every 50 years, the Jews were to have a year of Jubilee. And at the heart of, the, of this, the kickoff of this year was a very special celebration and, and service connected with freedom and liberty and deaths released. Man, what a great year. Wouldn't you like to have a year of Jubilee right now where all your debts, all your credit card debts are just cycled, gone, put in a bin, mortgage, done, no debts. Wouldn't it be great to have a reboot like that every 50 years? Now you have to plan for it. If you're the lender, you better be careful on that. I get it. But when it comes to the Feast of Tabernacles, it begins on the 15th day of the seventh month. Do you know when the year of Jubilee was to begin? It was to begin on the 10th day of the seventh month. What event is that? That's Yom Kippur. So every 50 years, the year of Jubilee commenced on the 10th day of the seventh month on Yom Kippur. Follow very carefully. What a day. Because something's happening that day, and now you're going to celebrate the release of all your debts and liberty and freedom. So the year of Jubilee was really foreshadowing the millennium and Christ dwelling with us. So when you go through these feasts, and you're trying to put the sequence together, what is happening on 1260? What's happening on the 1290 day? What's happening on 1335th day? What's happening linking in with tabernacles? It has to relate to Christ being here and the establishment and the start of the millennial kingdom. Okay, it's, it's, it's connected. It's connected. So the, we'll see it a lot better when we're in the millennium saying, oh, pastor said a little bit of this and he had some of it right maybe. <laughs> maybe not all of it, but he had some of it right. It, these, these fall feasts, point to Christ coming, his revelation, not the rapture. It deals with the gathering of Israel. It deals with Israel looking to their Savior, finally connecting the dots, where Christ establishes his kingdom, year of Jubilee. Look on your, look on your, on your Jewish calendar. It's very tricky. When is the next year of Jubilee? And we know that there's the hidden years of Israel. We, there's a very complicated topic. I get it. But tabernacles represents millennium. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, slavery, it's bad. <laughs> God permitted it, and he, he gave guidelines to protect both entities, but slavery's always been bad. Uh, Leviticus 26, verse 2, it talks about Sabbath should be forever. Get your good lexicon and look up the word forever. It's the Hebrew word olam, and depending on the context of olam, it will either mean for a long time or forever. This will really, really help you with a lot of interpretation when you understand the meaning of words. Olam will either mean a long time, like a millennium, or it can mean forever, no end. So, uh, yes, right now we do not worship on the Sabbath. Uh, God has set that aside. There's a ceremonial aspect to that. Uh, we worship our God on the first day of the week. In the millennium, guess what? We go back to the Sabbath timeline. So there will be some Sabbath in the future. Great question in chapter 27. These are really good ones to end on. 
Leviticus 27, 3 and 4. Who read this at some point and asked this question? Why is a female worth 20 shekels less than a man? Men rule. That's a horrible answer. That's a stupid answer. Okay. So let's read the text. So in the Lord spake, chapter 27 on the Moses, and he's talking about vows and keeping promises and what it would cost. And the estimation, verse 3, shall be of the male from 20 years old to 60. So how many men here are 20 and to 60? How many men do we have? All right. So right now, uh, you're valued at 50 shekels. Okay. And then... Um, after the shekel of the sanctuary. And if it be a female, then thy estimation should be 30 shekels. So how many girls here are between 20 and 60? Don't forget, don't, that's a dumb question. You never, you never, thank you. Jonesy, I knew it, I knew it. Okay, thank you. And Vicky, thank you. Liar, liars, pants on fire. That's horrible. All right, so the guys get 50 shekels, you know, four and a half months of work. That's a lot. You better be careful what you promise because if you violate it, go, if you default, you pay. So why is the guys valued at 50 and the women at 30? Does that bother anyone? Because we know scripturally, theologically, we are all image bearers, male and female. We are equals before Christ and the cross, totally. But the man, thank you. Wow, thank you, Steve. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Steve. You're scaring me. Let me give an illustration of value. This does not violate the intrinsic worth of a woman and her value as an image bearer of God. Last week, we're putting in a red flagstone Colorado sidewalk. I love Colorado. I love our red flagstone. I love those rocks from Lyons, Colorado. So I went to Pioneer up near Broomfield, and I need um, enough stone to go about 40 feet and about three, four feet wide. So I go in, I say, well, I'm interested in your red flagstone, Colorado red flagstone. Where is it? Oh, it's against the wall, fine. Um, and, you, and they just say, well, you can go out and get it. I'm saying, are you kidding? Where's the help? Where is the help? Where's the help? So I go out this week and I, I begin to go through those piles. Uh, it's chicken wire around the rocks. So you gotta lift the rocks up and around the chicken wire. And the rocks are two feet by four feet, two feet by three feet. They're two inches thick. Some are three, some are an inch and a half. Average is two inches. So I am 63 years of age. And I'm trying to load my F-150 with enough trucks, enough rocks where, where the tires aren't meeting the upper part of the wheel well, okay? Right? You're, you're, you're saying, how much weight can I get on my half-ton truck? So you weigh yourself before you come in and you weigh yourself when you go out, kind of smorgasbord flavor, okay? And you pay for the difference. So I'm out there, it's raining, and those rocks were getting heavier and heavier and heavier. So I went in, and there's Bubba, who's like six foot 20, 400 pounds of rock himself. And then I got this, this cute but... Chunky monkey lady, okay, that's really insulting, I'm sorry, but the chunky monkey little lady, and then there's another option, okay, you tell me who I'm going to pick, okay, am I going to pick Seth Marincer to help me move those rocks, am I, because a child is valued less than a 20 to 60 year old woman, right, and someone older than 60 is valued less than a 20 to 60 year old woman in this passage, so am I, going, am I going to go and say, Seth, can you help me pick up these 120-pound red rocks? That's embellishment. They were probably only 80 or 90, okay? But they felt like 120. A am I going to go to Bob Dylan? Bob's not here, so I can make fun of Bob, all right? Am I going to go to Bob Dylan, who's 90 years of age, and say, Bob, this is your old cabin. You've always wanted to walk up there. Would you help me load the rocks, Bob? Okay. Would, would I go to Tammy Blumenthal? She's in the 20 to 60 category. Tammy, can I have you and Rianne? Can you help me carry these rocks? Are you kidding? I'm going to go to someone who's manly and strong. Paco. Bob. Okay? Jason Wilhelm. 
Now, these men are no greater than Rianne Blumenthal, and they're not superior in, in intrinsic value to a Seth Marincer. But I'm not going to ask Jonesy or Vicky to come up either, right? <laughs> Despite your lies of your age. Just quite frankly, I want to move these rocks. So I went in there, and I said, lady, I, I can't lift. I'm lifting up two by four foot rocks by two and a half inches. And, I, and it was that the last things I'm putting on, I said to her, I, I lied. I said, I am a lawyer and I'm gonna sue you if I don't get help out there. And I want the biggest, toughest guy on the, on the lot to come out. I'm not looking for Seth, who will be a man, and I would, I'd ask Seth to work in 20 years. I'm not asking Rianne. I'm not asking Bob Dylan. I'm not asking Jonesy or Vicky, all right? And it's not because they're any less or any greater than Bob or Paco or Jason. The reality is, with that kind of work, I want those guys. I want those guys. That's the point. That's the point. Okay, that's the point. You wrestle with that. Someone's raising their hand, Pastor. Oh, honey, please don't, don't ruin my whole sermon. <laughs> okay, let me ruin. This 63-year-old lady lifted all the rocks. I tell you, two old people up there on the hill, honey, would you grab the other end of the rock? <laughs> And we lifted those rocks, and we put those rocks down. We played with rocks. We can hardly walk today, but we moved those rocks. And I've told you there's rock under the mud. There's rock under the mud. There's rock under the mud. <laughs> and I tell you, how many 63-year-old women do you know who get on the back of a pickup truck and say, I got this end, do you have the other? I said, let's do it, sweetie. Let's do it. So th this is a Bradford County country farm girl. They're the best. Guys, if you're going to get married, marry a good, strong, virtuous woman, okay? Get a farmer's daughter. Get a farmer's daughter. They're the best. And we move those rocks. We move those rocks. But if I had my choice, where's Jason Wilhelm when I need him, okay? Where's those young guys? I, I know the food bank, and I we have work days. Guess who shows up at the work days? 85-year-old men and women with walkers. Okay, and, and you say, praise the Lord, they come out, they come out of, out of the woodworks, eh, hey, help you out, <laughs> what can I do, you know, yeah, you say, thank you, sweetie, your heart's in it, and thank you for being here, you're an encouragement to my heart, but we really need some 20 to 60 year old men, okay, you get the point, okay, you got the point, tough question, oh, time doesn't allow me to answer it, oh, it's so sad, Tithing, what practice in the Old Testament, what is commanded in the New? What preacher wouldn't jump on that question? Well, but I won't. I won't. And then a fabulous theological question. I'll just, I won't answer it either. Just what's your appetite? This would be a sermon in itself. Where did people go, believers go, when they died in the Old Testament? Okay, that's a great theological question. So you folks who are Sheol compartmental theorists, you have your answer uh, that'd be a good one to come back to. So these are great questions from the book of Leviticus. Hopefully this has been uh, <laughs> enlightening in more than one way tonight. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, we'll be looking at numbers in a couple weeks after our anniversary and look forward to continuing to go on Route 66. Let's pray here. Heavenly Father, thank you for the night. Thank you that we can, we can laugh a little bit. And uh, we know when we get tired, we get a little silly. But we know that laughter does good like a medicine. And Lord, with the seriousness of this world around us, it is really good just to laugh, to fellowship, to tease. We thank you for Christian camaraderie and fellowship. We thank you for every book in the Bible. We know that our Christian experience is tied to every one of them, that you have something for us to know and to learn and to apply, that all the Old Testament was given for our understanding, for our benefit, for our edification, for doctrine, for our practice. So, Lord, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for our church family. Bless us, protect us, help us to serve you well. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.